Today, we are back on the topic of election. And as you likely know, election is hotly debated, especially among Calvinists and Arminians. In this video, we're going to bring some clarity to that debate by looking at three different ways the Bible talks about election. Before we get started, take a quick second to like this video, subscribe to Theology Project on YouTube, and click that bell so you get notified when new content posts. When we're talking about election in the Bible, it's important not to confuse categories, and that's why we need to recognize that the Bible talks about election in different ways. The first way that the Bible talks about election is in terms of unconditional corporate election. Unconditional means that it's not based on anything in the human being being chosen. Corporate means it's the choice of a group of people, not an individual person. We see this in the Bible. In Genesis, God chooses Abraham's family as his instrument to bring blessing to the nations. That doesn't mean everyone in Abraham's family will be found faithful in the end. It simply means that the family as a whole is chosen on by God uh, to be the instrument of God's blessings to other nations. This idea shows up in Genesis 25, 23, when Rebekah is pregnant with Jacob and Esau, uh, she feels them struggling in her womb. And we are told that she has two nations in her womb. One will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So we've got Jacob and Esau, but God's choice of Jacob over Esau is articulated in relation to his descendants, in relation to his family, in relation to the nation that will come from him. Jacob, the Hebrew people, and Esau was the father of the Edomites. So the focus isn't on the election of individuals, but on the families that these individuals represent. Unconditional corporate election. Later in the Old Testament, in Malachi chapter 1, we get the sort of infamous passage where God says, Jacob I've loved, but Esau I've hated, and we struggle with that. It's helpful to remember, though, that that passage has God articulating his choice of Jacob in relation to Jacob's descendants and his passing over of Esau in relation to Esau's descendants. So again, this is an individual election for salvation. This is the election of a group of people for a particular task, namely to bring the blessing of God to the nation. In the Old Testament, an individual can be cut off from the elect group. So in Exodus, there are a variety of circumstances articulated under which a person could be cut off from the elect people. So the people are chosen. God selects Abraham's family, the Hebrew people, as his instrument to bring blessing to the nations. But participation in the elect people is conditioned on keeping covenant. So if you break the Sabbath and work on the Sabbath, you can be cut off from the elect people. So the group can be chosen, and then individual participation in the group is based on certain conditions. Going back to Genesis 25 and Malachi 1, these are the passages that Paul draws into Romans chapter 9 and quotes them. And that suggests that when we read Romans 9, famous passage on election in the New Testament, the fact that Paul is drawing on texts that clearly articulate election in corporate terms suggests that Paul is thinking about unconditional election in corporate terms in Romans 9. So the burden of proof should be on someone who thinks Romans 9 is about unconditional individual election since Paul is drawing on texts focused on unconditional corporate election to articulate his understanding of how God chooses Abraham's family to be a blessing to the nation. The second type of election in the Bible is conditional individual election. So it's conditioned on something that the individual does. We've already noticed this sort of thing in Exodus, where an individual can be cut off from the elect group of people for not keeping covenant. And the same idea shows up in the New Testament. We're going to take a minute to consider 1 Thessalonians particularly. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul describes the Thessalonian believers as chosen by God. That's the language of election. But in 1 Thessalonians 3, he tells how he sent Timothy to see if the tempter had tempted the Thessalonians such that they fell away from the faith, that they'd fallen from grace. He was worried that they his work would have been in vain because the Thessalonians hadn't persevered in the faith. They hadn't met the condition 
for remaining in the covenant. So when Paul begins with God has chosen you, he doesn't then run the sort of logic that says God has chosen you and so I wasn't worried about the tempter tempting you. He says God has chosen you, but nevertheless, it's possible that you could have been tempted in such a way as to fall away and I wanted to send Timothy to find out about your faith. So you've got individuals who have come into the church and are a part of the God's chosen people. That doesn't necessarily mean that they remain unconditionally elected. They could fall away. Quite clear in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 3. The third kind of election in the Bible is unconditional election to vocation. We see this in texts like Galatians chapter 1 verses 15 and 16 where Paul talks about having been set apart before he was born by God so that he could preach the gospel to the Gentiles. The crucial piece here is that statement of purpose. He talks about being chosen, being set apart, that's the doctrine of election. But what's the purpose of his having been chosen or called or set apart? The purpose is not his final salvation. The purpose is his vocation to be an apostle to the Gentiles. This jumped out at me uh, years ago when I was reading a commentary on Galatians by a well-known Reformation scholar and commented on this passage and used it to substantiate a vision of unconditional individual salvation. God chose Paul, therefore he's going to be saved unconditionally. But that's not at all what Paul says. Paul is describing God choosing him for the vocation of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And that is a vocational election, not a soteriological election. And the same Paul, who says he was set apart before his birth to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, is the Paul who in 1 Corinthians 9 says that he disciplines his body so as to finish the race. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I punish my body, I disciplined discipline my body so that after proclaiming the gospel to others, I myself might not be disqualified. So there's Paul's vocation to proclaim the gospel, but that doesn't necessarily mean that his final perseverance is a given. That means he's not unconditionally elect as an individual. He wants to be faithful, and so he disciplines his body so that he might persevere and gain the crown at the finish line. There you have it. Three types of election in the Bible. Unconditional corporate election, conditional individual election, and unconditional election to vocation. It's crucial when you're reading texts in the Bible to, when the, in the language of election shows up, to discern which one of these types of election is being discussed, and then to interpret the text based on that framework, so you don't make a category mistake, and assume that the Bible is talking about individual election when it's actually talking about corporate election or vocational election. Thanks for watching Theology Project. Remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and if you found this helpful, share it on social. See you next time.